Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Emmanuel Derman on the line. He's head of risk at Prisma Capital Partners and a professor at Columbia University. He's written a couple books. Uh, one is My Life as a Quant, one of Business Week's top 10 books of the year, in which he introduced the quant world to a worldwide audience. His latest book, Models Behaving Badly While Confusing Illusion with Reality, can lead to disasters on Wall Street and in life. Emmanuel, how are you doing this morning? I'm good. Thanks very much for having me on your show. Thanks for coming on. Could you you got an interesting market background. Uh, could you just look, give us a little bit of your education and your background in the markets? Sure. Um, I'm born in South Africa. Um, I came to this country to get a PhD in physics in the late 60s. I went to Columbia University and I actually studied physics and worked as an academic for about seven years after getting a PhD. And, um, and then life in physics got difficult, hard to find jobs just the way it is now, the same way it was sort of 35 years ago. And eventually I took a job at AT&T Bell Labs to, in order to be in the New York area where my wife was. And five years later was recruited by Goldman Sachs and um, worked on quantitative work over there. Okay, and then from there you branched out on your own. So I'm sure there's a lot of different uh, ways that you could describe quantitative analysis, but why don't you give us your description? Okay, yeah, I've done this for like 30 years, and um, I think I have a fairly good overview. You know, th well, the first thing is um, just background. People have always been quantitative in the financial world. It's just they've gotten more quantitative over the last 30 years, and everybody, traders have become much more numerate. But people have always used models, you know, price over earnings ratios. That's also a, a numerical way of trying to understand um, stock returns. Um, there are two general approaches. Um, one is statistical, which just means looking for patterns in the past and correlations and hoping that they project into the future. And that's very common these days with all of big data. And the other, which I worked on more in my life, related to derivatives and options is sort of what I call structural and quantitative, where you try to understand the market as some kind of, um, I'm stretching it a little bit, some kind of mechanical or electrical system like weather or an engine, and you try to write equations to describe that system and make predictions or understand things. Am I, am I making sense? Yeah, you are. Uh, do you do, I mean, you come up with your ideas. Do you have just like a, a bunch of programmers that you just throw these ideas at them and have them work on it, or do you have a programming background? I have a programming background. I was in physics, and physicists are sort of jack of all trades. They do all their own dirty work, which I think is a good way to be in the world. And um, then I worked at Bell Labs, and I really did a lot of programming in the 80s. So I always pretty much did my own programming, although if you want to... Um, if you want to deliver something to traders, like a real trading system, you need professional programmers as well. Um, it's kind of good to, good to have a combination. Um, and ideas, you know, ideas come from, you really, uh, you really have to work closely with traders. In fact, I sort of, I did theoretical physics, and I tend to think of being a quantitative analyst as being like a theoretician, but you have to work with experimentalists, and traders are the experimentalists. And they understand best what's happening in the market and what the, what the latest patterns and what the latest events and pressures are. And you have to work closely with them and take their insight and try to mathematize it, so to speak. Okay. Are you using, uh, I mean, that's a great point, you know, the traders and people that are actually in the markets. But along with that, you know, traders have discretion. Do you, uh, do you build any discretion into your models or your trading? Or are you just strictly, you go with the signals, put in the orders, and let things happen? No, I, 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 um, I don't. And the places I've worked, I've worked at, um, at Prisma or at Goldman Sachs for a long time, don't do that either. People use models, and they think in the framework of a model, but if I can get a little highfalutin, no, no model is really the same as the world. You know, when you write down a model, it's a kind of idolatry. You're imagining that you can write down equations that describe the way markets and living people behave, and that's not literally true. You know, you can maybe write down an equation that describes how the Earth goes around the sun, but you can't do that for the way people behave. And so models only work in a very limited range, and you always have to overlay it with common sense and limits and some sort of discretion and a high degree of skepticism. Okay. What makes your models unique? Um, I've written a bunch of models that are widely used over my lifetime. One is with Fisher Black, who's the developer of 
the Black Scholes options model, which is one of the big successes of quantitative finance. And I think I learned a lot from him. And, and um, I, I, it's related to what I said before. I really try to walk a middle ground between being an academic and being a trader. If you purely academic, you don't really know the way the world works and you don't really know the business world. And if you're just a sort of dumb trader in the old-fashioned sense, you, you're not numerate. And I think the trick is, and what I try to do is to, is to use academic techniques but apply them um, in conjunction with what traders know and try to quantify traders' intuition and understand the way the market behaves and take their insight and try to make mathematical sense out of it. Okay. Uh, boy, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the quantitative strategies and high-frequency trading in the markets, and really the markets, uh, the machines have uh, replaced the market makers in a lot of sense. Uh, just a, a, a guesstimate here, what percentage of the volume uh, in, in the equity, mar- equity markets do you think is based on quantitative strategies? Oh, I don't know firsthand, but I'm pretty sure you know, with high-frequency trading and algorithmic um, market making, it's got to be 60, 70, 80 percent, I well, would guess. Quite a bit. And That's quite astonishing. You know, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen in a way. I, um, um, I mean, I buy, I buy airline tickets and movie tickets over the Internet. There's no reason why people shouldn't trade electronically. There should be limits, I think, but, but there's nothing intrinsically wrong with just the fact that people are trading in an, in a, in an electronic fashion. And do you use uh, different models for different time frames, or do you just try and just be a long-term trader and just focus, you know, on longer-term trends, or do you try and do anything for shorter time frames? Well, it, it depends who you are. I mean, if you're a if you're a an individual sort of small small player, I think I think you should think long-term and think more about fundamentals in some way because you can't really compete as a single person with the. Uh, massive forces of, of, um, of you know, high-frequency trading. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, I, think you have to, I think depending on who you are and what your advocate is, you have to use different models for different time frames. Um, be more fundamental if you're thinking about the long run. And um, in the short run, people often trade on momentum or mean reversion, if, if you follow what I'm saying. Yep. If, things are go- yep. if they think things are going up for a short time, momentum traders um, over, the short, over the short run, um, continue to do that over the longer run. They might rely on mean reversion and coming back to what everybody else is doing. So yeah, uh, it's an eclectic business. I think it's a mistake to think that, um, as I said before, any model is a kind of um, idolatry or foolishness if you take it too seriously and you have to sort of be eclectic. Okay, and what about uh, the use of uh, technical analysis or funded data, fundamental data in your models? Is there, is there, do you have different models for technicals, different models for fundamentals? Do you have a mixture of the two? How do you do it? Yeah, um, I mean, I think in the long run, fundamental data is what counts. I mean, the short run, um, meaning minutes, days, maybe even sometimes weeks or months, um, technical stuff matters because you're really trying to describe people and their patterns, and, and they do follow patterns. Um, they don't always follow the same patterns, and when everybody gets used to them, the patterns change. But, um, yeah, I think you need a combination of both. And uh, are you always looking to create new strategies to, uh, to replace the old ones that are no longer working, or do you just have a couple that are really good that you stick with? You know, I personally don't do high-frequency trading, but, yes, I think... Um, there's a funny story that I once heard, if I can illustrate it, sure. about Jim Simons of Renaissance Technologies, who, who've made oodles of money over the years. And I heard a story about him speaking somewhere at a conference at NYU, and somebody asked him, are you going to publish your models um, when, when, when you're finished making a profit with them? And apparently, and this may be apocryphal, he answered, when I'm finished with working with them, there'll be no point in publishing them because they won't be true anymore. And... Um, I think I think that's true. When when everybody in the market, especially in equity trading, starts following everybody else and trying to use the same model, you reach a point where that model doesn't work anymore because everybody squeezes all the juice out of it, and um, you do have to replace the models. And I think that's 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 uh, the state of the art in in high frequency trading. People are always copying each other and trying to find new patterns to trade off until until they don't work anymore. 
Yeah, Dennis, Dennis, uh, my partner, co-host on the show, talks a lot of that about that a lot. You know, different strategies worked in different time periods. Uh, you know, now we're just in a, a runaway bull market, so there's a lot of people out there that think they're pretty smart and have pretty good strategies. Exactly. But when the market turns, we'll see who the survivors are. So we, I mean, we got to get to talk here about high frequency trading here, and um, I think that I'll first start out uh, by asking you to comment on Michael Lewis's comment that the market is rigged. Uh, where do you stand on that comment? You know, I like Michael Lewis's book, although it's a little formulaic, but I mean, it's got a good lesson to teach. Um, I don't know firsthand, but I'm inclined to believe a good part of what he says. Um, I mean, he, he over-exaggerates to make a point. Um, <clears throat> I was saying before, this is my opinion, I think, I think, the fact that things are electronic and algorithmic is fine. It's the way the modern world works. But I think paying for co-location and special access and for setting up special kinds of trades that are there just to suit your strategy but aren't available to retail customers, that's not a flat playing field, and I'm, I'm kind of against that. I don't really know what to do about it. I like Brad Katsuyama's approach. I don't know whether he's actually going to persuade the whole market to go his way. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line from, from um, I think it's from William Blake, that says, you can't know what's enough until you know what's too much. Yeah. And I think this is like too much, but I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know how you roll back the how you roll back the clock. I, I think you have to. I have to agree with you on that. I mean, just that some of these firms don't have a losing day. I mean, I can attest to as a trader, and I'm sure anybody else in this chat room as well as you. I mean, no one makes money every day. I mean, and if you do, then you know, good for you. But uh, you, in order to make money every day, man, you got to have some kind of edge over people, and uh, you know, whether it's a co-location or not, I I would agree with you on that one. So, uh, you know, besides the co-location uh you know do you think they have any other unfair advantages i mean dennis and i go back and forth a lot about you know the sub decimals and stuff and uh you know for me i think that really fogs the market uh do you think hfts have any more unfair advantages i think the co-location and paying for paying for faster execution that seems kind of unfair to me and against sort of all the, all the, I don't know, principles of sort of rational capitalism. Um, the, fractional, the fractional prices, um, uh, it, it's, um, I, I, I'd be in favor of, of, um, of sort of having mini auctions every few seconds so people can't get the advantage of, <laughs> of um, you know, of, of, of this very high speed need to beat everybody else and figure out what they're doing. It's sort of, I don't know how you stop it. Everybody who does it says um, it helps efficiency, as though efficiency is kind of the the mark, you know, the the ideal ideal of a whole world. But um, I think they're talking their book to some extent. What about internalization and the payment for order flow? Um, does that uh, is that something that you uh, that you follow at all, or could that be an unfair advantage? Orders never getting to uh, to the you know to the retail traders. The payment for order flow. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big expert on this, but okay. um, um, as I said, I spend most of my life working on derivatives, but all of that stuff sounds um, a little esoteric and, um, um, yeah, a, a okay. little too much. All right. Uh, Garrett uh, on our desk here is, uh, you know, he's talking about the automation and, uh, you know, making an analogy here how, you know, cars replace horses. You know, is automation, you know, eventually going to replace, you know, humans in the marketplace? I think it's to some extent it's reached that point. I mean, a lot of the day-to-day -day market making is isn't done by open outcry anymore. And certainly, anybody who builds a new exchange these days does it electronically. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I think it is. I mean, it's human. I mean, don't forget it's humans that write the programs. Um, um, but but the actual execution is going to be done by machines and and the algorithms. I, I think it's unavoidable with the sorts of volumes that you have. What one needs is a good set of principles. And I, I like, I've only read about it really, I once heard him talk at Siyama, but I only heard about it really through Michael Lewis's book. But I think having a simple market where everybody understands the limited number of trades you can do and exactly how they're executed um, is better than all this kind of invisible dog pool stuff.
Yeah, I have to agree with you on that one. So, uh, you know, for investors that, uh, you know, want to learn about quantitative strategies but don't have quite, the, you know, the physics extensive background that you do, uh, you know, how, how would you suggest they get started? Um, there are a bunch of books one could read. I also did two websites that are pretty good, actually, although some of them, parts of them are very technical and parts of them are more like a chat room. One of them is a website called Wilmot.com, W-I-L-M-O-T-T. Okay. Um, and, it, and it's sort of a, a, a quantitative quant sort of chat room come discussion place, come argument, and there's interesting information and good tips over there. Um, and not necessarily that technical, more opinionated. And then there's a very good website called SSRN.com. It stands for Social Sciences Research Network.com. And almost anybody that writes anything in the quantitative area um, from the academic or even practitioner side puts things over there. And obviously some of the articles are going to be very technical, but you can find reviews as well. Okay. Uh, do you do it for uh, equities or do you incorporate your programs in the futures as well? Yeah, I've always been on equities, equity derivatives, fixed income derivatives, uh, futures, and exotic options, stuff like that. So in a way, not so much on the retail side, more on the market making. You know, most of the work I did was, um, was helping desks um, hedge their books or manage their risk in the in equity options or fixed income options world, futures as well. Okay, so that leads me to my final question here. Uh, with the market uh, making new all-time highs here, uh, pulling back off a little bit of geopolitical concerns coming into a three-day weekend, uh, what are your models telling us about this market now? Is it time just to uh, you know, put on some serious hedges or... You know, is, thing, is this just another opportunity where you see a decline in the morning and the market just battles back and will continue to make new highs? You know, I, I, don't, have, I don't have models that predict the future, not personally <laughs> the futures of the, of the, of the uh, equity indices. I must say I'm kind of shocked at how the market has tripled since its low, you know, uh, in 2008 or 2009. And I think it's um, you've got the Fed to thank or to blame for that. Okay. All right. And um, um, yeah, I don't know. They're they're interested in in pumping up uh, pumping up value. And I think what's happened is, quantity, my my amateur opinion. I'm not really an economist. I'm a finance guy. But okay. All the money they pumped into the market has gone to the top level rather than to the bottom level to people who don't really need need um, to make a living earning jobs and so it's gone into sort of speculation in real estate and commodities and housing and um, I said that and, and, and okay. equity markets and I think that's behind it. Could you and give as us long those as people could, trust the Fed that's gonna continue. Okay, could you give for, us those for one day they won't. Could you give us um uh, could you give us those sites again that you mentioned uh, for people that want to learn more about quantitative strategies? Yeah um, one good one is Wilmot W I L M O T T dot com www.wilmot.com. And what was the other one you mentioned? That one's a sort of academic one. It's called SSRN, Social Sciences Research Network.com. Okay. All right, Emmanuel. Thanks a lot. And you can, you can download anything off there, but um, the, the, first, the, the SSRN is kind of more technical, but they're general articles too. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. You've given us uh, really a clear look at uh, you know your outlook on quantitative strategies and high-frequency trading. We've enjoyed it very much, and we'd like to have you on again soon. I'd be glad to. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Okay.